This is The Naked Life with Roxanne Noor. Hello. Thank you for coming today to your studio. <laughs> <laughs> Right yes. now we <laughs> we are sitting in your studio. Thank yeah. you for having me to have you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and so you're a really interesting figure on this island, especially because there's many there's many spiritualized people here, a lot of yoga, a lot of meditation, but there's not so many people I meet here mm -hmm. who are as far in the film industry as you are. You've done over 400 commercials. You've been in the film industry for 13 years. You've made documentaries um, about music and the arts in China. You have like a plethora of knowledge and wisdom that I would like to go into today. Mm. Um, yeah, especially around, around your craft in particular, documentary films. How, how would you describe in your artistic process, like what parts of a story or what stories in general are worth chasing to you mm. and worth making come alive? Because there's... There's so much information we're fed with every day. And actually, if you scratch the surface of anyone you meet, there is something interesting there. But in particular for you, what do you feel um, the most fulfilled from what you've made come to life through the art of documentary filmmaking? Yeah, I, it's usually there's a consistent thread that it's like, it's adversity. So when someone's facing adversity, they're either gonna crumble or they're gonna generate power and it's like, it's that moment that you can, if, in the story process, if you can demonstrate and you can run through their, their story to show how that power grows and why it's growing. So it's got intention, it's on a mission. Um, at some point, something incredible is gonna happen. So it's kind of finding stories and people that are game changers, people that are, and it, a game changer could be an old lady on the middle of the street who is campaigning to make sure that that, that road doesn't become a commercial street that's that, that's a great story um, or it could be as epic as you know a rock star in China who's the first person to ever play rock music on national television 2005 so it's like just whatever the story is I'm interested in individuals that face adversity and they decide to to go for it so yeah so in let, let's take apart one of the films that you've made, one of the documentaries you've made. You mm. brought up this, this rock star in China. What was it in his spirit or what he did for rock music that you felt propelled to, to working with him? So he's, we're talking about a, a two and a half year, a three year project that I filmed from 2014 and we launched it in 2017. And the, over those three years, the initial brief was to go in and film one of his rock shows. And he was doing a 36 city tour around China and he'd seen some of our work and he said, look, I'd love you to come in and make my tour documentary. When I went in there, it was like, I didn't really see a, a rock scene. It wasn't like a typical, what you'd imagine the backstage of rock star to be doing. No cocaine. It was, no, there was no <laughs> cocaine. There's no, there no, uh, there no girls. There's no, there, so it was kind of like, okay, he was in a whitewashed room. He had some, you know, it's very simple. There was no riders. Like, you know, in the West, it's, you, you can order a whole buffet of, treats and that's that's what we imagine so I was kind of immediately kind of like okay went out to see the stage the show was incredible he was amazing but then afterwards they came off stage and it was like back to the hotel go and see some fans go to bed and I was kind of like okay this is going to be a really kind of boring documentary so I met him the next day and I talked to him a little bit and I sort of said look I need to go back to Guangzhou I need to go back to my city in China and have a think and then I went back and I was kind of mulling it over and I couldn't see the story and I couldn't see what was going on. So I did, you know, research the guy online. He was super famous. He was one of the judges on The Voice of China and he's on there every week and you can see him judging and voting. And so I was kind of like, okay, what is this guy? And he's getting ridiculed in the media. He had some sort of past relationship stuff going on. People made jokes about him and he was kind of super famous. So I kind of thought, okay, he wants to change his image. and He's trying to get, so the only way to do that is kind of get into his story and find out what makes him tick. 
And so when I went back up to Beijing, I flew up with my team and we sat with him and all his team. And uh, it was very rigid. We sat in an office and it was like a big long table and it was like just super boring, super awkward. Like I didn't speak enough Chinese, he didn't speak enough English. And then afterwards I kind of said to him, would you mind if we just talk somewhere else? Like just me, him and my translator went and sat in his office. And I started asking him about the media, about his presence, about what he was trying to, and he just started to pour out like about the actual situation of what happened and then told me some stuff about his mum and his dad and they were, and then you start to uncover this story. It was, it, so I, I would then said to him, this is, this is it. This is like your life story has to be told. It's not been told before. Um, and we're talking about China. This is a, a country where, unless you've been to China, you've seen the scale of what it is today. It's incredible. Like you've got cities growing. It's the fastest growing number of millionaires anywhere in the world. Uh, they'll grow a city within two years. They'll have an entire city built. So it's like, wow, this place is huge. And <clears throat> that, mo that innovation, that growth came from the Cultural Revolution, where China was just, it was basically farmland. It was just farmers. And during the Cultural Revolution, where we know that unofficially that around 70 million people died during the Cultural Revolution. So it's one of the biggest, I don't want to say the word genocides in history, but it's massive. And we're talking about major, I use this word very, carefully brainwashing mm. where it was you know follow the red book so you always had the, the classic image of the, the the husband and wife with their hat on and this pitchfork and there would be you know this is China we're, we're gonna work together to uh, build the, the future and in that whole process you know millions and millions of people died and so his parents were in the army they were in the Communist Party army and that was we're talking in the actual epicenter of Mao Zedong. So what he was, he was the first child to be born out of the Cultural Revolution. Something that we, as most, most of us, can't understand. We've never grown up in that kind of regimental environment. The, only, the closest thing we know is North Korea, right? Where everything's just completely locked off. There's no Western media, there's no entertainment, there's no music, there's no nothing. That for me is fascinating. It's like, what is the flower that grows from that concrete? Because it, I see it as concrete. It's like the way that people are sort of, they just cut and paste. It was like a, a sort of brainwashing thing. And so for him to become a musician when that was his whole childhood, basically. Yeah, like his world. And that is, that is such an interesting story. And the fact that it's completely different from their original plan of what they wanted because mm. they basically wanted you to come in and, and film him touring yes which isn't as interesting as like actually the intimacies of his his life right yeah exactly and how to get to a place of artistry yeah that type of conformity is just not even in our western like it's just not even in our thoughts we can't we can almost not even imagine it because we haven't experienced anything close to that right right and then also because of what you're saying about them being so conformist, even the approach you took to make it about him as an individual and like really specifically his childhood is in his story. Mm -hmm. So much of Asian culture is about saving face and not showing vulnerability, not talking so much about your, your past, your family. You don't want to bring shame upon the family. 100%. So this yeah. is... Um, yeah, this is beautiful that you found the thread of what makes the story not only interesting, but like this, this space of intimacy. Mm. Yeah, and that's, that's what I felt it needed. Two and a half years into the project, he had his whole entire legal team set up to take me to court because he didn't know what I'd made. I was, in, I was editing for three months uh, once I'd finished the actual filming and production. And they thought I'd basically just take it the money and just ran. When I sub submitted the film to them, they were just so happy. They were like their entire team were crying. They were just like, they were sending me these messages of just going, you've completely nailed it. Like you've, 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 you've got him. And then they were just, they were like, we, we were about to sue you. <laughs> yeah, so I was like, okay, that's good to know. But, but yeah, like this, the story, just to paint the picture a little bit. So his parents are in the army. We know that in 1986, the doors of China opened. It was the end of the Cultural Revolution. And we know that also that we had 
the Tiananmen Square massacre, where a bunch of students were, were, were shot down. And so there's, there's major, major things happening. And if both his parents were born in the army, by four years old, they used to lock him in a room where he'd play violin every day. And that was their kind of way of raising him. They were like, you're not going to go and play outside. You're going to stay inside and you're going to learn the violin and you're going to go and play the violin for the, for the Chinese people. And so he lived on a naval yard. And every day he was listening to just a certain type of classical music. And his father and mother just taught him in, in the Mao Zedong kind of way. So he would reminisce and he'd talk about looking outside the window and seeing children playing outside and remembering, like, feeling like, oh, I wish I could play. And so, he, yeah, he had a tough time. So by the time he hit 12 years old, he's a superstar. Like, he's at the, the Beijing Conservatory of Music. And this is the most prestigious music school in China. 12 years old, he knows nothing but classical music. So imagine that little boy, he's like this vessel who's just completely like, yeah, this is my world. So just pausing that for a moment, in the West, in the US, they, they would send, like as they do today, they were sending old, outstocked cassettes, like music cassettes, and they were sending crates of these things to China for landfill. So China was just taking on all the trash from around the world. And so when these cassettes arrived in China, massive crates would arrive in China. We're talking Pink Floyd, Rolling Stones, like the Chinese customs would cut all the cassettes and destroy them. So then no one could actually listen to them because they don't want that music in. So then gangsters would buy these crates of cassettes and then they would rent factories or they had factories down the, on, the, on the piers. And they would have men and women come in and they would by hand put together the, to salvage the cassettes they could salvage and they would st uh, glue them back together. Those cassettes would then go on the black market in China. So you had the vibration of like, we don't need no education or, do you know what I mean? Like of ultimate rebellion. Yeah, like, like the like, government like, is trying to destroy exactly. the music that you're piecing back together and then giving through a black market yes. back to the people. Back to the people. That is so funny. And here arrives Wang Feng, a 12 year old boy, communist parents, and he receives this cassette. Uh, through, the, through some kid at school at the, at the conservatory music. And it's super like, you know, you get in trouble if you get caught with this stuff. So he gets this cassette, he takes it home. And he's never listened to anything but classical music. And he puts it on and the album was The Dark Side of the Moon. And he just listened to the music for the first time and he described it like his whole body just lit up. It was like for the first time he was, he didn't have no idea what they were singing. Like he had no idea what the lyrics meant, but he said, it, it was a sound and he was like, he knew that that's what he wanted to do. It was like, oh, like this is it. So he set up a secret band. So he was, he basically went around his university and he picked out like really good musicians and he, he practiced down in this basement where no one could hear them. And they, they practiced, practiced uh, rock music and they just copied everything they could. Like just learned everything they could. So that was the, and that's the essence of the story and it's like, his father then threw him out of the house. As soon as he found out, he had long hair and started wearing sort of rock clothes. His father threw him out of the house. He lived on the streets. And like, it's a, it's a great story. And it's like, how do I look at it? I zoom out and I look at it like, you've got this really brainwashed like machine. And then out of that, this little flower grows. And it's like, that's Wang Feng. And um, the thing I thought and what I saw was, it was the, the relationship between a father and son. And uh, that same relationship that had so much turmoil was the same as the old China and new China, this sort of handover. And then this allowance of creativity and art and things that were extinguished during the Cultural Revolution. Like they shut down everything, all art institutes, music, everything. And they have very strict, you know, things that were allowed to stay, but most creative things were gone. So it's like, I felt like it was the code that China needed to listen, to, to hear. Uh, and that sounds really arrogant, but it, like it was a healing. The response from the public afterwards, we premiered in Beijing and uh, we had 400 VIPs and media there and it spread. It, like We had 2 million views on a video on demand platform, which is like a paid platform within 10 days. Um, 2 million within yeah, 10 days. Yeah. Wow. So it was like, it was incredible. It just, it just blew up. And then the comments online were amazing. Just thousands and thousands of comments of people saying, I never knew his story. I feel so bad because I never understood him, but now I completely, oh, I have the same relationship with my father. I had the same, you know, mm. so 
it was epic. It was just the, for me as a, as a documentary maker, that was a, just epic. There's multiple aspects of the story too, what I think is interesting. Mm. And one of them is the way documentary film gives a method of humanizing mm. and a really discreet method of actually re-education. And this is what I see as the art of storytelling, is yeah. there's the way you can just directly give someone information factually, mm -hmm. or packaging it with a narrative and with emotions and interviews in which the person is, like you're watching them express something very raw and real, and how that can redefine uh, a whole person and then therefore a culture actually. Yeah. And yeah. the second part of what I thought you were interesting is what we see a lot in the arts is that something is trendy and so a lot of films are just basically replicas of other films. Mm -hmm. What you were doing actually in a way is seeing a space within the market of a certain story being neglected. The media was portraying him in a way that had nothing to do with his actual story but more what you were saying relationship drama. Mm -hmm. And you were giving like a certain amount of depth that most people don't get to see. Yeah. And that's to me one of the most beautiful things about arts is the ability to really humanize someone else mm. and to give a voice to the, I mean, he's not voiceless because he's like famous, but there's two narrations where you're giving a fresh voice or you're just, yeah, giving a voice to someone who doesn't have a platform. Yeah. And both are super beautiful. You've nailed it, absolutely. Thank you for saying that. You can see it. When you're inside it and you've got a kind of a no, an understanding of the basics of, of lighting, of cameras, of sound, editing, of storytelling and how to lead with curiosity, you feel as a responsibility. I had a, a, a company at the beginning of that with uh, 20 staff. We had a 400 square meter office with the studios and we were doing really well. We were doing great commercials. We were flying all over the world. Life was good. We were making money. When that project came on, we lost everything. We just systematically over two years, we went from a full buzzing, like a buzzing office to three of us in a, like a tiny little cupboard. So it was like, and I don't mean that in a victim way. I mean like we gave up everything for this story. And because you feel like, oh, I have to, this is important. I think this is worth chasing, yeah. Yeah, when we travel and we're in different countries, having this outsider looking in narrative and we can kind of we can see outside of ourselves mm -hmm. but within our own western culture what are some of the stories that you feel are being neglected that you would like to see a light shined upon or yeah, yeah that you would like to create or that someone you see is creating but it's not getting enough attention wow straight away older generations older people like oh, i thought about this so much like going to old people's homes and this makes me emotional talk about it but it's like it's going to an old people's home and trying to connect because I used to go visit my granny and she died a couple years ago but she used to go visit her and as I went through there was like just like she stayed in an old people's home that was owned by my cousin's husband so it was like a really she had a really good life and but when I went in there the other old people didn't and they would sit in like long rows and they would just sit there all day and you know they would get fed at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but otherwise they just sat there. So as we went in, sometimes I'd stop and just talk to someone. And it was like seeing a little, if you stayed long enough and you found the right person, a, like a little light turns on and you see their eyes sort of brighten up and you see like they kind of come to life. And then when you leave, they kind of then shrink back down again. And I thought, wow, you know, like they're full of stories. They are us. Right, and it. We, we're, our future. Yeah, this is this is our future. <laughs> yeah, they are us. I would love to just go in and, oh, like, the thing that got excited about was, you go in and you start speaking to one of them, and they tell you a story about a dance, and then there's always someone that like, the one that got away, you know, like a love story or something, and if you could somehow find, that person and then reconnect them, do you know what I mean? Like, like. That would just be the, wouldn't that just be the greatest gift to give someone who had nothing? They're just in that moment, they're frozen in their final moments of life and they're helpless. They don't know how to use the internet. They're not going to pick up a phone. To get to a phone book, you know, like 
it's just an impossible task. So I'd love, I'd love to just document that. That would just make me, I've thought about that a lot. Yeah. This sounds like something also that, that we would all benefit from in the sense of in the West, how we see becoming old with just becoming completely invalid and useless mm. and making people like that feel visible again yeah. and feel yeah. seen. Yeah. And exactly. the fact that it's just like having someone who has such a breath of life mm. of living 90 years and channeling like a certain type of wisdom of what's happened in the past and learning from that like going straight to the source instead of reading about a specific period of time through history books like going to that person that would be the interesting part of the story mm. for me and when yeah. i think about older people too and what i would want to learn from them is they've seen so much of history and how they how they perceive what's going on now and yeah the way we treat them is really sad what was funny about your thing is maybe most of their lovers would be dead already. That's no. why <laughs> you're like trying to find. Right, but, right, right. So <laughs> but I'm sure there, there, there must be one or two. Sorry, John. You're dead. They're all gone. Dead. <laughs> Are we allowed to laugh? <laughs> we have to. It's like an inevitability of life. There's like, <laughs> it's like you laugh so you don't cry. Yes. You know? Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, did you get one? No. <laughs> I'm also thinking, like, you brought up before all the things that have to contribute and connect and come together to make a film. You talked about the lighting, the editing, the pre-production, the post-production. There's a quote, I'm going to paraphrase it, but it's, all arts aspire to music. And in some way, this is so true. How do you see when you're making something and you're wanting to drive home an emotion, mm -hmm. what do you see as the balance between, yeah, dialogue and, and action or just using the space beyond words, just using, yeah, melodies, frequencies, music. Yeah. And you also to point out, your brother is a composer, yes? Yeah. So yeah. you also have insight into the world of music and then the convergence of that in film. Yeah. I mean, first of all, just to mention musicians who are composers, like not just people that play music, but people who compose music. They, for me, are the greatest visual storytellers ever. Like, even though it's nothing to do, like they're doing music, it's just vibration, it's music. What's I don't know, yeah. like when you listen to music, like the oh, story yeah, yeah. is happening in your head, like you don't yeah. need the visuals. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, but then somehow what I've noticed, there's something that was a phenomenon to me, it was when I sat and listened to my brother talking about story structure and dialogue and tones and tonality, temperature, you know, where are we moving? And he, he was so amazing. I was like, oh, is this just Jake? And then Rob, who's another friend, he's a composer. Again, he like, we were talking about, we were listening to some music and then we were like just playing. We are like, oh, imagine this part of the scene, like this is happening. And we started creating like a story, just listening to music. And he was just on it. He was just like rolling out stuff. And so you've got some friends that are music composers get them talking about story ideas that are amazing. You were saying about music and how it can drive a, a moment. The, 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 the thing that came up instantly was a film called Lion. Have you seen this one? There's a scene, and I don't want to create any spoilers, but like, there's a scene at the end when he finally goes back to a certain situation and he's looking for someone. I was just fighting back. Like, whole, I was on an airplane and I was just like literally holding the seat trying not to cry. And I was just like, Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Like, I, I was like, it was just destroying me. And in that moment, there's no dialogue. It's just him looking and trying to find someone. But I was so deeply connected to that story. So I remember the scene vividly now. Yeah, yes. and it's like, so in that, for me, the most powerful moments are, don't involve dialogue. And it's all about, the dialogue is always gonna drive, it's the context. It's always building up to that moment. Um, and maybe, of course, dialogue can happen. It's a moment when someone might say, I love you, and you're always waiting for that to happen. Or you know, So, of course, dialogue could be the champion in, in a moment. Something but, yeah. comes up for me, too, about films that are good at driving home a message mm. and films that aren't. And what I've noticed with the films that are very good is they're not forcing you to feel. 
it's not super blatant and in your face. It's more subtle, and it, I think it's exactly what you alluded to, that the dialogue in the film gives you the contextual narrative on what is actually going on, mm. but the music and the lighting is like tuning into the space beyond words to get you to that capacity to truly feel the moment. Yeah. And I think we've all experienced this in life when the most beauty is unfolding in front of us, it's like we go silent and you can't, you can't express words because words would make the moment futile. It wouldn't do it its full justice. And I feel that in m so many films that I've seen, the, the most emotional moments are through action. And the action is combined with a song mm. and the song is what makes you feel. And yeah, yeah for me really, music is this apex of feeling and when i think about some of my favorite movies it's because they had a really killer soundtrack yeah yeah big time have you you've seen moana no i actually haven't have you not seen moana no <laughs> oh shit. Are you, are you a fan do you like disney films you, some of them some of them yeah so this one is like there's a moment at the end and it's a little girl and it's a big terrifying sea monster i don't know how to describe it it's like a human slash humanoid fire and it's it's terrifying and there's this tiny little girl and she's just holding this small and it the, the innocence of that moment and then the, but the music if you hear the music of that moment it takes me instantly back to that scene and i'm so like again i'm like holding onto the airplane seat just trying to like oh shit oh fuck. i find it hard to cry it's like i'm not allowed to <laughs> oh, you're such a man. <laughs> it's, no, no, it's, it's, ridi it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's, it's pointless. I should just go for it. You should just cry. Yeah. Like, should we do cry no, on the airplane. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. Airplanes like, are great places to cry. Don't, don't, I've cried on so don't. many airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I love music. My God. That's all we, I mean, man, we spent 12 years in China and we could have chosen, I could have done wedding videos and got paid like $10,000 a job. I could have, you know, there's a whole load of different, I chose music and we didn't make money most, like we made some music, we partnered with um, Sennheiser and did a bunch of productions with those guys who were incredible, but like to make money in the music industry and video production was tough. Like we had to really like get like partnered with the right kind of sound companies and that took time to develop those relationships. And But music was always our driver and we made that our driver. Like we always turned down jobs that weren't aligned with that. And the greatest, most beautiful thing in filmmaking for me is the moment when you're looking through a lens as a camera operator and you're filming a singer. And a really, like a, ideally like in an intimate moment where it's, there's not lots of movement, but when they're singing and you're, you're absorbing every word and you're choosing the shot and you're choosing the experience for whoever's gonna get, go and then watch it afterwards. But I got to experience that with world-class musicians, like really top-level musicians on so many different stages and so many different, it could have been like a very intimate little jazz cafe or it could have been a huge stage on a big concert. But to be able to look through a lens and absorb that energy and be the one that's kind of flowing with it and telling that story in the live moment, there's no greater feeling. And like, I don't smoke weed. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't mention this, but I did a couple of times and that enhanced the experience even more. Like, <laughs> in, in, in a way that's like, I, I hope, in fact, we're gonna do it here. Like, we have to, we have to. I think we're gonna set up, I'm gonna get some live musicians, I'm gonna get a camera, and I'm, we're gonna get, yeah. We're get gonna, some weed. We're gonna get some weed. <laughs> <laughs> Try it when you're high. Um, no, we're doing that, for sure. It's done. Yeah, I want everyone to experience that. It's, it's incredible. I don't know what it is. It's, it's like, it's like, you're crystallizing a moment that's so unique and it's their voice into a microphone that's then recorded into sound, but then you're there absorbing it kind of like, and it's like surfing, I guess. It must be like surfing, like really high level surfing. And you, it's an honor, you know, that you feel like privileged to be there. There was a multitude of musicians that you filmed. You said another one was- Mu uh, Yeah, and yeah. the other one was a composer, you said, of classical music. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes. Muhai Tang. So uh, it was a job. I went to Tianjin Grand Theatre, which is a huge, like Tianjin is like a very wealthy city in China. And it's where the government used to be many years ago. And it's like big money kind of place. But it's like you go there, it's desolate. It's just like just big concrete buildings. And it feels kind of, oh, it's kind of weird. 
all the restaurant, everything shuts down at nine o'clock at night and it's like dead, it's a ghost town. So I arrived there and I was there to film a friend who was a, a sound recording producer. So he records classical operas, uh, operas, classical music, concerts. So he's there with this company Sennheiser and he's gonna set up all the sound for this like 200 piece orchestra. And I'm supposed to be there for one day, one day or two days just to capture the microphones being set up and then I fly out. But when I was there, I got talking to the conductor in a break. I sort of just walked over and said, hey, I'm filming you today. How are you doing? And I just started asking me questions. Oh, yes. Yeah, so I said, could I ask you a bit about your story? He said, not now, but if you come for me with lunch, I'll tell you everything. It's like, great. So I went and met him for lunch and um, people were like, why are you talking to the conductor? Like, don't. And it was like, oh, it's okay. So I'm just being cheeky and just kind of pushing my way in there, and uh, which is definitely the way to do it. And so the way to do it in life is yeah. to follow the curiosity. Yeah, and just, do, you just go for it. 100%. Like if you're genuinely curious, like chase the story, like go for it. There's moments you know you're there, there's like 10 different people around, it looks like he's kind of tired and he's like got this sweat and he's like halfway through the break and it's like people are hanging around because they want to talk to him, he's a famous conductor. And then you're the one that pushes in and goes, hey, how you doing? Like I just wanted to, and you know when you're stood back at that moment, it could be a party with someone socially, it could be, so, and you're kind of like, oh, should I go and say something? Oh, I don't want to bother them or, Da, da, da. But if you're documentary making, you go, like you do it, yeah, for sure. And then he told me a story and it's like, he was the only guy to leave China during the Cultural Revolution. And he wrote a letter to the government and said, my father's a famous film director, my brother's a famous actor, I want to go and bring back the best classical music I can to China. This is my mission. And the Mao Zedong himself signed the letter to approve it. So he was the only one. And he went out and he went to all over the world and he was a conductor, he was like a director of music. And so this, what I was filming was his return to China. And the guy's now in his 70s. He was doing, he funded it himself because he couldn't get the funding, but he'd spent like hundreds of thousands of dollars. And he'd flown in the Romanian uh, opera, like the vocal opera. I'm not sure, is that the right word? Name? I think so. Uh, flew in 200 singers from Romania. Imagine the flight cost, the logistics in the hotels, 200 people, and then had an entire Chinese orchestra. And in six days, they did Beethoven's Eighth Symphony or Fifth Symphony, can't remember, and they did a Rigoletto opera in six days. And usually you'd have a month to prepare for one of those at least. And it's, most of them are used to the sheet music. So I was like, my God, what a story. Like this guy's returned, this is his big showpiece. And I, and I called the client and I said, this is a story, we've got to do it, it's going to be amazing. And they went, no, like, it, you're out. Like, you can stay if you want, but it's cost. So I just paid myself and I paid for my hotels and flights and, and stayed stayed there for seven days. So you did it yourself without I did a team? It, I did it myself, yeah. Wow. So then I stayed on my own and oh, it's a playground. Like, you've got like, the whole place itself is like 10 football pitches. And it, you can walk for like, I think an hour like around the place and still be completely lost and not know where everything is. Uh, it's huge, like really, really big. Like at some points I was just lost. I was wandering around with my camera gear, like what the fuck? Like, Muhai! Like it's echoing. <laughs> um, but then, uh, yeah, it was just, oh, I got to stand in the middle of a whole entire orchestra whilst they're practicing. And when you feel the vibration of strings and the swell of music, and I'm sat, again, I'm sat watching through my lens and I'm, I'm there and, and he's getting angry and he's getting happy and he's, he's, all his emotions are coming out and I'm just capturing it and I'm like, oh, do I zoom in? Like he was doing something like this, he was commanding like this. And so I was just zooming the lens a little bit with him and just trying new things that I hadn't tried before in the moment and trying not to trip over anyone's violin foot or something. Um, so, ah, uh, yeah. And then I nearly, I nearly got killed actually. I, like, uh, in, on, on the Rigoletto Auto Opera, it was a full opera stage, like full, like massive. So behind these things, you, it's like, I think it was like a hundred meters drop down, like on the stage. And that's where they keep all the different stage pieces. And then up, it goes up really, really high as well. So when they have the new sets coming in, it's all done pulley systems. So you're not supposed to be back there. And I was back there and I was, I mean, this thing was coming down and it's solid wood and it's coming down really fast. And I think, uh, yeah, I just missed. Anyway, just moments just where I just, died. <laughs> yeah, I just almost died. So I was like, and then I was just trying to collect myself and go, I was just overwhelmed. Like it was just like, I shouldn't have been there. I was a totally random, like 
object. And he gave me permission to be there. So everyone was kind of like questioning, who, who are you? Like, Muhai, it's my friend. So yeah, it was great. It was, yeah. So, and we got it into a film festival and it got selected and we didn't win anything, but yeah, it was a, a lot of fun. Wow. Yeah. And so for people who are starting out in the film industry and in the arts in general, what is some advice that you would give them for, yeah, for following a dream, for following a story? And I think you brought up a bunch of good points between not losing artistic integrity just because of money. Yeah. So yeah. How, how do you see, yeah, first of all, let's start with your advice to, to young people starting off. Really practical advice, yeah. really like the best advice ever is don't overshoot. Don't, as in literally, like don't just film, 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 film and getting like a hundred interviews and a hundred pieces of like B-roll. Yeah, like you put yourself into a position where you create this mountain that becomes this impossible task and I've done it tons of times. And then as much as you're chasing the story, get it done. Like get the edit done and then you can show it to friends, get feedback, but don't don't get into this like precious mindset that oh it's not going to be it's not good enough or it's not going to be finished until this time or that because you so many friends you, you, you like talk to any film friend you have and say how many projects do you have unfinished like that you love and they're like oh fuck I've got loads like it's a real thing so I think get your projects done choose yeah yeah choose don't overshoot be specific and yeah clarity vision yeah and then make sure that when you when you are shooting and you are taking on projects, like finish them, get them done. Other, otherwise, if yeah, you end up you end up with something that's unfinished, then you're always got these excuses, these procrastinations. It's like I, th I think go for something small, a small project, and get it done and wrapped, and on to the next one. And you can revisit the projects later as well. So for the people who are sort of perfectionists, or yeah, how do you know when you're ready to let something go? How do you know when the editing is complete for you? I don't think it ever is, and I don't think, I don't think I've ever been like wholeheartedly satisfied and complete. So there's a feeling like there's always more that can be done, but at the same time, you need to release things. You need to know when to let go. Yeah. And it's never going to feel completely satisfied, but it should so. feel like it's good enough. Yeah, and that that in that moment, then you you want to accept that, have an awareness of that, and then just you just be like, okay good then I can play and I can enjoy the process there's definitely a level of compromising your artistic integrity to, in order to please a client or to, in order to please someone who has some, some kind of stake in the project when I finished the music documentary on the the artist we'd lost everything making the film uh, I would handed it in they loved it they said we'll pay you the rest of the money and that didn't cover our costs right we we lost and they said it's done we're so happy and I said no it's not done it's not ready for Netflix we need to get it on Netflix, like the Chinese Netflix. And they were like, oh, but I think it's done and we're just, we're gonna share it now with our fans. And da -da. I said, no, let's, we, like the story's too important. We could, like if you just say it, share it internally, it's kind of, and they, they, they were just disagreed. And I said, fine, I'm just gonna go do it myself. And, and then, <laughs> and then the, the artist then turned around a week later and said, because I wouldn't stop, then he won't stop. And he kind of went, I'm, I'm with you. What do you need? So he's like, he was then with me and we managed to get it onto the Chinese Netflix. But then in that moment, it was like, what, was, what happened? I had this beautiful film that I was really proud of and happy with, the, the tone. I just wanted to elevate it. But then what I opened up was a whole new world where I introduced the Netflix. So all of a sudden with Netflix, it's like, I say Netflix, it's called iQiyi. It's a Chinese platform. Did, did they basically want to re-edit everything or make it what it wasn't? They didn't have a lot of say on the artistic style, but okay. there was things like I couldn't touch on the culture revolution and I had to be very careful with how I talked about certain topics. And it was, yeah, it was a tricky situation. And all of a sudden, what I finished with, the film that I finished with, wasn't my, like I made all of it, but it was done in a tone and a style that was to suit the Chinese market, not, not in the style that was me. And the artist said to me after the, the premiere, he said, thank you, thank you so much for everything, but I missed you in that, in the new film. What you created before was you. That was when we were like on, and Did he was right. Did you feel it was still worth giving to the world because it happened? The, yeah. 
it was still worth it. Yeah, because to have a film that I made that deals with China, culture revolution, the army, like to do that and launch it on the biggest platform in China is mass. Yeah, it's like a. So it yeah. didn't feel so compromised. There no, was a compromise. That was a but success. It was a massive success okay, in good. that sense. But I've got my original film, which I found like a year ago. And I just, I was like blown away. I was like, oh, I felt so much pride. I haven't, I haven't screened it here. And that's when I realized why, that's why I haven't shown anyone because I'm not proud of it. And when I found this old one, I was like, I'm gonna show that because I'm super proud of that. So I'd say I, I made the film that I wanted to make and it was great. And then I compromised myself by doing something that was to please others. And then it went wrong. So that's another thing for young, oh, for young filmmakers. Young filmmakers. I'm only 39. Shiny. And you know, <laughs> just, 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 just We're talking thing. about people who are in their <laughs> teens. Yes. For the young teens, the teens. coming out. Teen what, what do you, you, you've touched upon this. Do you feel like with everything going on in terms of catering to mass demographics and censoring do you feel this is really a huge diminishment in the arts from what you've seen or yeah. do you feel like it's just natural mechanism of society to limit in order to contain like right now it's like a cocktail of everything it's like things that would used to be completely absurd um, are now mainstream and then things that are it's such a cocktail of so many different things happening right now it's hard to know even know where to stand but I would say that when we do experience real stuff, it, it resonates. Probably not getting the kind of mainstream exposure, exposure that, it, that it, should, it should get or it deserves, which is really sad, right? It's like a, we see glimmers of it. Things kind of manage to get through and, and poke through and kind of surface. But there's so much noise. We're fed so much sugar crap. I'm not going into like a rant of like, but like, yeah, it's... Like the Avengers movies, you know, like these superhero movies. I enjoy some of them, I, I do. But generally speaking, it's so like, where's the art, where's the art in things? You know, the actual, there's deep messages in there, sure, but the guys are designed to get sales, they're designed to make us consume. It's all connected with buying things that aren't really good for us. It's not feeding our souls. There are touching storylines between relationships, between partners, between friendship. They, they talk about honor, they talk about justice, they talk about yeah, beautiful things that are important. Are we as humans just addicted to crap? Like we start to get fed dopamine. It's like a dopamine addiction. And all of a sudden we're finding ourselves watching stuff and it's like, why am I watching this? I'm not even enjoying it. Like I also have another theory and I see this a lot in America with people who are so overworked and they yeah. go to the television not to be intellectually stimulated or to be free thinkers, but they go to turn off their mind. Mm. And so you're watching the reality television, you're watching the reptilian news, you're watching all these things because it allows you to go more to sleep. Yeah. And yeah, yeah when you've just worked a 12 hour shift and you're tired, you go to the TV to turn the mind off. Yeah. And there's a difference, I think, between art and just pure, sheer entertainment. And a lot of entertainment is built upon other people's suffering. It's built upon feeling superiority. And it's not feeding the most benevolent sides of us. And I think as artists, we have a duty in a way to create what we wish to see more of in the world. Mm. You yeah. have, yeah, you have a young daughter and Gen Z and yeah, her generation is going to be complete. It's already completely infiltrated by the media in general. What do you see as the future for, for, yeah, this generation who's just been born with it, basically. They've gotten all of it so young. Mm. And what do, you, what do you hope to see in the media? What do you hope to see more of for your daughter? I like to think that something really beautiful has happened in our lifetime, in the last 15 years. And it's this massive, the, there's obviously these conspiracy theories about right and left divide and the media's stoking the fires and all sorts of stuff. 
But I think we've got to a point where we've spilled out to the edges of madness with it all. And I feel like for Indy's generation, she's seven years old, I feel like it's allowed light to be cast on areas that's usually just hidden away or like, we don't talk about gay, you know, don't talk about this. Like, it's always like a, a shame. But now because it's, it's been allowed to just party and go, Aah! like just it's all out. It's, I think it's a good thing. I think it's like, I think she's going to not be part of that. I think she's going to be part of the, I think she's going to be part of the generation that brings sense and, and unity to all of, the, all of the separation, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, I love what you just said about that is the beautiful part of the information age in general is the fact that so much information is available to us. Yeah. The dark side would be what you touched upon before, that the the generalities, the masses of it is quite shit. But yeah. but the fact that we are able to speak about pretty much everything. Yeah. 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 Which is amazing. Which is great. And if people get caught to the idea of like, oh, look at this group. They're always talking this way. Look at that group. They're, and it's like, okay, well, you're getting inside the story of it all. But all I'm seeing is things are opening. I'm excited to see what happens. And I, most of all, I, I love hearing other people's stories. I love celebrating other people. Like if someone's doing something and they're doing awesome, I'm like, go for it. Like it's epic. I hope that people can start to share more of that and celebrate each other and not have this idea that when we, when we see someone sticking their neck out to say something and to express themselves, maybe we don't agree with what they're saying, but maybe we can just have a little bit more time to celebrate them and just be like, you know, if someone's saying violent things, it's different, but in general, I'd love to see more art, and more expression and less fear of being exposed and more celebration of being vulnerable and putting it out there. Yeah, I would agree with you. I think the celebration of, of vulnerability is essential to more and more people opening up. Yeah. And when I think about some of my favorite documentaries that I've watched, the people were making it, were putting themselves in extremely vulnerable situations and with extremely vulnerable people. Yeah. And there is a dedication to something so beyond themselves, to a vision in which they see the world at large and like how you said you were willing at one point to be broke to to put everything away yeah. to just deliver this because it was what you felt you wanted to see more of in the world and so you you made it yeah big time what are your favorite documentaries you've seen and why what does it touch upon the best documentary that i thought wow is the act of killing have you seen this one then the reason why is because without adding too many spoilers, I'll try not to, I'll try to explain it without adding spoilers. They took gangs in the, I think in the 70s or 80s in, in Indonesia, when Chinese families moved from China to escape the Cultural Revolution, they moved to Indonesia and the Indonesians locally hated them. They were like, we don't want this Chinese scum. You know. And so these gangsters would just torture and murder these Chinese people. And so what this documentary team did is they went into these, these towns in Indonesia where these gangsters still existed. These, and they're much older now, in the 70s, you know, 60s and 70s years old. And they managed to convince these gangsters that they wanted to make a Hollywood-style production to reenact their heroic acts in how they murdered these people. Because they see themselves as heroes still to this day. They're like, yep, you know, we cleaned the streets kind of thing. So the pinnacle of the whole, the climax, was this actual production that this documentary team produced where they literally had people with red socks tied together to, to imitate blood. And, and these gangsters were like uh, laughing as they're reenacting all these things that they did. But then there's a moment when the scene stops and these gangsters are stood there on set and they're kind of staring at the floor. And then one of them just starts like throwing up. and you see them just mentally degrade when they realize the horrors of what they committed. And the documentary team risked their lives to be able to, it wasn't like a prank, isn't that masterful? Getting these guys to relive what they did. So when I saw that, that, like, that blew my mind. I was just, what a brave team. There was an energy stored in these people that was then released through purging. And it was just incredible. So that's like mind blowing. And then you've got beautiful, 
documentaries like Searching for Sugar Man. It's a fantastic like, documentary about a musician who, I can't say anything about it because I'll spoil it, but it's, it's amazing. The name is super familiar to me. I don't know why I haven't seen it. Maybe I have yeah. seen it. So yeah, documentaries, the ones that touched me was one in Romania. It was orphanages in Romania by BBC Documentary. And they went inside an orphanage with kids and they were there because they told the orphanage that they were there to help them get funds. So it's like the one thing that would allow an orphanage to, that was corrupt to allow a documentary team was, we're gonna create a video for you and we're gonna get you loads of money. And the, the manager, obviously, there was just asleep enough in their brain to go, okay, like just greedy enough to, and then there was a, a gorgeous girl. She was always telling the crew that her dad was coming that weekend, but he never came and he didn't exist. And she was all looking out the window and then you find out that she's being raped by the cleaner, the caretaker. Loads of things, like there's a boy who had a broken leg and they didn't fix it or take him to hospital for two months. And then all the children would just sit and rock. I remember watching that and thinking, like, that's darkness. That's like, that's a part of the world where love just hasn't managed to exist at all. And it's the people that run that place are as broken and unloved as the children who they're torturing, essentially. Literally, it's torture. They're, they're not feeding them properly. There's, there's, the kids are devoid of love. And when you see the, the documentary maker break the ultimate rule, which is then obviously going in and disturbing. If you're going to film something and document it, you don't want to be an influence on it, right? But she goes in and she just starts hugging the children. And it's like, it's heartbreaking. It's like, it's tough to watch. You see stuff like that and you go, I don't want to fit in the system. I don't want to just get a nine to five job. I want to go out and let you do something that shines light on, on things that need light shining on them. And I tried doing that in China. I did a film, the, the dog meat trucks that went, they were sending like thousands of dogs to go and get, taught, they, they tortured them. Sorry, it's really dark, but no, go yeah. ahead, yeah. they would torture dogs before they boil them alive or skin, they'd skin them alive because they believed that the adrenaline made the meat taste better. Like really the worst thing, and they got pleasure out of it. It was a, a pleasurable thing for them, obviously, because I, I can't see how anyone you would do that. You could do it, yeah. yeah. I was, I won't go to the long story, but the short story is some friends that were doing it, I told them I'm ready any time to film. They intercepted a truck. We got a thousand dogs and about 500 cats all stacked up on these crates. And you've got probably 30% of the animals inside these stacked crates are dead through heat exhaustion and dehydration. And then we've got probably 150 volunteers, all Chinese, like young students, like wanting to help. And we, managed to offload these wire crates that are stacked. So you've got to do it one at a time. That A lot of the volunteers, are, they're not strong enough to carry these kind of things. So you've got a few numbers of uh, people to do it. And so we filmed the whole process and we managed to get, get all these dogs and cats off, distribute them across the city before the police came. And then that night we had one of the locations where there was 20 gangsters outside with bats and spades and they wanted to come in and kill the dogs. So they called me and my friend, we came over I came with my camera and we stood at the gate and I'm stood there with my video camera with these Chinese gangsters. And they, th these guys, uh, like, they look like rough, tough people. Like they, they, they're not messing around. And if we're not there, because we're foreigners, they don't want to cause a international incident. So yeah, it was, it was rough. And then they just wanted to come in and kill the dogs. They didn't want them near their, their place. And then we managed to, in the end, we stayed there until 6 a.m. They managed to get a load of trucks to go and take the dogs and cats to a monastery. But that's one truck. And I would say like what then happens is all the dogs and cats get photographed. There's some volunteer vets there. And then those photographs go online. And then anyone, because these are dogs and cats that have been stolen from people's homes, they're pets that belong to people. About 60 or 70% are pets that belong to people. And the rest are like farm dogs. They look like they've just been born in a swamp and spend their entire life. They're just a mat of hair, the saddest eyes. And their eyes are like gone, you know, that's like drooped down. And they've got, there's no one home. They're gone. They're done. They just need putting down. There's, there's no like, oh, let's give them love because they need it. It's like, and I've got, I've got videos of all the looking into all their eyes because I just wanted to get that. So yeah, it's like you, you see stuff like that. And I got threatened after that and told that if I continue doing that kind of filming, it's like the guy was basically saying, you'll end up dead. Like the, the police are involved, the government's involved. Everyone's profiting from it. And all the f and in the West, people are watching these videos and they donate, I'm not saying donate money, don't donate money, but people are just donate money and it's all going to like this organized gangs and 
It's, it, they don't even know what they're donating they to. They don't, no. And organizations like Animals Asia, 100% legit. Like, Ricky Gervais is behind it. We did a whole event with them, and uh, bear bio farming. And at that point, I had a wife and a child, and I was like, like, how can I, how can I help shine light on the world that's not going to put myself at risk? I c of course, I could just keep doing it, and but I, I was just like, no, I think there's better ways to do stuff, and maybe there'll be more to it. I, I do feel like one day I, I will go back to that and try and help. I feel like this is also a really common story with people, especially documentary filmmakers and journalists are always an enemy of the government basically yeah. or of certain institutions in place that when you are showing the horrors that people usually get to blindly walk past mm -hmm. and not pay attention to and exactly as you said you're shining your flashlight upon it it's a threat yeah. like and that's exactly why the government knows that artists are a threat mm -hmm. because it gives way to actually seeing and there is something with the fact that the way we learn in life is so much of it is visual that mm. actually watching these films sensitizes us to the issues in place we can think about things conceptually but that watching atrocity on a screen it's a completely different somatic experience it gives us more compassion more yeah. empathy i remember even when i turned vegetarian I was vegetarian for 10 years, and a huge part of that was sensitizing myself to the issue, was watching documentaries about the meat industry right. and seeing what was actually happening and not being able to disassociate from that pain. Because if I'm just seeing the chicken that's served on my plate, it's not exactly real to me. Um, yeah. yeah, and so seeing the way they're treated, the way they're force-fed, the, their lives before they even die, it's so important in life mm. to to feel, yeah, to and to know things. Yeah. And that's why I think the work you're doing is so amazing. Mm. And yeah, thank you so much for for today and this conversation. Thank you. And yeah, for being in your studio and actually for you even setting up a space like this where people can come in and can make things and can create. I feel like the island that we're living on really needs it. Yeah. And I feel like, yeah, doing your course with you and yeah, using this space has been so helpful for me. Awesome. And yeah. This is like, I'm so happy. You're the first person to just come in and actually use it properly and go for it. And then the fact that you've actually hired someone else that took the course and you've been, and they've been using the editing room, it's like, I described it in a very playful way. I described it to Fred as like, man, it's like The Sims, and you've you created like a restaurant, and you've got like <laughs> customers coming in, and everyone's yeah. using it. Like, it just felt like we built something, and I, I, that's what I want. And I want to be in here as well. I'm not. I don't want to be. I don't like the idea of being a somehow like a business manager and just how do I maximize the profits? Like, I want to be involved in in the actual productions, and and uh, yeah, this is it. This is the beginning of something really exciting, and I think we're going to have production teams growing. And we're going to go out and tell great stories uh, that do change things and offer new perspectives. So I'm excited. Mm, I'm excited too. Cool. Thank you. Yes. <laughs>